I want to give you a, a glimpse of Jesus today. I hope a greater glimpse than you've had before. Luke chapter 9, I want to read to you about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. And it begins, beginning to read at verse 28, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendour talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfilment in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as the men were leaving Jesus... Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then in brackets it says there, he did not know what he was saying, which was fairly typical of Peter. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. In fact, in the, King, the old King James, it says, and they saw Jesus was found alone with them, <clears throat> alone in, in this place where he had taken them for this special message. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that the Spirit of the Lord will take a hold of any words we speak and apply them into our hearts. Little, a little droplet, Lord, for everybody in this room. Something that they can take away, think about, chew over, and let it do something inside their spirits that will change their lives and reshape them into the way that you would have them to be. So we, Lord, we just commend ourselves into your hands now in Jesus' name. Now, the unfolding of the true character of Jesus is part of this marvellous narrative. It's a very exciting moment in the life of Jesus as he walked the earth. <clears throat> the glory of Jesus up to this point had been hidden <clears throat> under a very ordinary exterior. He just looked to everybody just like an ordinary man. There was nothing special about his statues. The Bible tells us that quite clearly. He wasn't a massive man of great power and strength. He just looked like an ordinary man. That's why when things began to happen around him and people were getting healed and the power of God was being expressed and his teachings were changing the hearts of people, they, were, they exclaimed, what manner of man is this? What manner of man is this? Who is he? Where did he come from? What's he doing here with us? And so this glory had been hidden from them until this moment. The people had been astonished at his teachings, amazed at the miracles that had taken place. But this hidden glory had lay hidden until Jesus revealed it to these three disciples these special three that he took with him into an unusual classroom on the top of a mountain, Peter, James and John. What a remarkable group these were. Now in the Gospels of Mark and Matthew and this particular Gospel of Luke, all the passages start with the word after. So when somebody says after, you say, well, after what? You've got to ask the question, surely, if you don't know what it's after, you don't know what it means. <clears throat> you know, I don't you know about you. Do you remember that some of the oldies would? The days when we used to call sweets or desserts afters? No, nobody remember that? Three of you? <laughs> Just shows how old I am. But <clears throat> Mum used to say, we used to say to Mum, what's on for afters? <clears throat> which is the dessert. We're more interested in the dessert than anything else. And she'd say, <coughs> rhubarb. <coughs> so all our eyes would twist in our heads <coughs> because she didn't know how to cook to save her life <coughs> and she never put sugar with rhubarb. 
So if she said rhubarb, we'd say, oh, we're not hungry tonight, Mum. <laughs> Don't worry about food. What's on for afters? <clears throat> after what? Now, as they commenced this narrative with the word after, I want you to understand what was taking place here. Now, the two Gospels, Mark and Matthew, say after six days. The Gospel of Luke says after eight days. Now, there's no discrepancy there. It's just simply that Luke adds the two days of the particular experiences to the moment. And so he says after eight days. So there's no problem there. But Luke includes the days. Now, the question is, after what? Now, if you go back in the context there, you'll see some amazing statements made by Jesus. <coughs> As he mentions to them the remarkable things about himself. Further down in verse 18, he says, Who do the crowds say I am? Who am I? And some said John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others, the prophets of long ago. <clears throat> but what about you, he said? Who do you say I am? <clears throat> and that's when that remarkable revelation came to the Apostle Peter. You are the Christ, <clears throat> the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, oh, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, Peter, but my Father in heaven. He had a revelation moment. And I'm asking the Lord today that revelation moments will strike the hearts of many of us in this day. And so that was the conversation that had taken place there on this occasion. But at that moment, Jesus began to tell them also about what's to take place. He said he must deny, <coughs> take up his cross, and he went on to say, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will save it. And immediately Jesus began to talk to them about what he was to accomplish in days to come. Peter said, oh, no, Lord. No, not you. Not you. You're our great king. You're our great Messiah. And he was talking to them about death. And it must have been a staggering disappointment to these men that had walked with him for years and then suddenly he talks about dying and here they are expecting him to be the king to rule and to reign to walk and rid, get rid of Rome and set up the kingdom of Israel and they were going to be sidekicks in his parliament <clears throat> and all of a sudden he talks about talking death <clears throat> talks about death now what what we need to understand is two facts the Messiahship and the saviourhood of Jesus Christ are confirmed in this process and the necessity of the coming cross. The disciples shrunk from it. Now let's understand, all of us understand what this means. There are times in our lives when the Lord begins to speak into our hearts and we shrink from it. <clears throat> Things he says we look as he looks perhaps into the future of our lives and we shrink away. We think, wow, I'm not going to go there. But what's happening is Jesus is establishing something in our hearts. Peter had confessed the Messiahship. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And had crowned Jesus, had crowned it with the fact that he says, oh, God revealed this to you. But you see, to them, how can... Jesus be Messiah and die. That's the thing that was rolling around in their heads and creating much confusion. How can he be Messiah and talk about dying? Now, I know you would feel exactly the same. The six days since he began to reveal to them about his coming death, etc., between them was before this moment of transfiguration. Do you ever have days of perplexity? When things are happening and saying, what in the world is going on? What is God doing? I want, to hear, want you to hear me carefully now. God has your best interests at heart. <clears throat> and he wants what is eternally best for you. <clears throat> He loves you unconditionally and wants what is eternally best. So even in those moments when you can understand what's taking place, 
Just rest back and say, well, Lord, you got my life in your mighty hands. I'm in the hands of the living God. The Bible says underneath are the everlasting arms. What more confident and secure position could you have than to be in the arms of the living God? Blackish Karabasia, Inchamamba, Wobo Hosea, the three of them were taken with him into this, uh, excuse me, he's talking in special languages. <clears throat> he took these three men for a very good reason, Peter, James and John, taking them into this remarkable classroom of truth. Peter, James and John were perhaps the most uh, remarkable in the apostolate. <clears throat> Peter loved Jesus, John Jesus loved, and James was going to be the first to seal his testimony as the blood of a martyr. Now you look at them and you think, boy, what a weak mob. And I look at myself and say, what a weak soul you are. But you see, it doesn't depend on who we are. It depends on, on who he is. And the fact is, in this, in this moment, even their blunders proved their strength. They were men of enterprise. They were men who wanted thrones and places of power. They were seeking for something. And they were with this man, Jesus, because they knew he was going to take them somewhere. Now, they were complacent and satisfied. While well, Jesus spoke about keys and keys to the kingdom and all those wonderful things. But when he started talking about death, well, that's, that's a pretty different story, Jesus. We're with you, but we're not going to death with you. <clears throat> basically what was in, in their hearts. But it proved their capacity to be men of enterprise. And listen, folks, you may feel so insecure sometimes and so completely incapable of doing the things God wants you to do. And yet I want you to hear me. It doesn't depend on you. It depends on him. <clears throat> It depends on the king's provision for you. I think of Gideon in the Old Testament and how he looked at himself. How He said, I'm the weakest in my father's house. I'm the, the least in my family. And God says, you're a mighty warrior. You're a mighty warrior. Get that into your spirit, will you? You're a mighty warrior. God puts it. It's what he says about me that works, not anything about that I think about myself. And so this moment was a marvellous moment. God, listen carefully, will you? God always has ultimate destiny in mind when he's dealing with you. You got me? Ultimate destiny. So what's happening now is part of the web that is being woven for the future of your life to fulfil the plan that he has for you. Ultimate destiny. There's an ultimate destiny for all of us. And God has that planned in his purposes. So look at John. In his inspired writings, he unveils the, un, unveils the wonders of the commandments and his love, his light and his love. James receives the king of the martyrdom crown. Peter holds the keys and in Pentecostal preaching opens the doors to the kingdom of all peoples. It's Peter that God uses to take the message into the Gentile world. Friends, these are the three men he took to the mount. He had a very, very good reason for taking them. Destiny, we may not know it, but God does. Our perplexities are caused by our inability to know what God is doing. And so we sit there trying to figure it all out. Don't try figuring it out. Just wait in the presence of God. Just be patient. <clears throat> patient. And learn that, if that's one thing I had to learn desperately, patience. <clears throat> In the process of growing with God and learning the art of waiting God's time. It's the time for everything, says the book of Ecclesiastes. Anyway, I better get on with it. Oh, I've only got 15 left. Star of the leaping catfish. Do you ever get alone? <clears throat> Do you ever get alone in a place of prayer with the busy world out there? And suddenly you realise how helpless you are. Yeah. But that's when we need prayer. 
And that's what happened to Jesus. He went aside to pray. And the Bible says he was communing with God in prayer. The demands and pressures of the crowd and the issues that are taking place in round must force us into the Father's presence. We say, Lord, I need my supply. I need my supply of your greatness. Now listen, the Bible is very careful to connect the transfiguration with Christ's teachings about the cross and the resurrection, as well as with the command to take up the cross. The Bible says that Moses and Elijah spoke with him about what he was to accomplish in Jerusalem. They were there sharing with him. And I'll talk about them in just a moment. The shadow of the cross had hung over Jesus all his earthly life. How would you like to live a life 30-odd years knowing that you're going to a cross. He knew what he had to do. He knew he had to surrender his life to the Father, Father's will. So think about the weight that he carried in terms of the human side of things. Jesus needed a ray of light, a ray of comfort. And I think the transfiguration becomes that, to sustain his earthly frame under the pressure of what he was moving towards in coming days. And he's in the last steps towards Calvary. The disciples did not understand him. He could not sit with them and commune with them and find some peer pressure help from the men that were around him. They even rejected what he said about where he was going. It was, it was, not, illog it was not logical to them. So this inner glory that had lay hidden until this special moment. There's a revelation of both deity and humanity in this passage here. Do you know he could have gone to heaven straight from the Mount of Transfiguration, but he chose to stay to go to the cross to do the Father's will. Man, that's a, that to me excited me. I think about, wow, it sends goosebumps all over me thinking of the majesty of this person. The transfiguration emphasises the fact that Jesus went von voluntarily to the cross. He freely laid down his life for us, the Bible says. Now, let's get into this passage from verse 21. It, 28, I'm sorry. It says, as he was praying, he was transfigured. Now that word transfigured is the Greek word metamorpho from which we get the English word metamorphosis. And it only appears three times in the New Testament. I'm using the three Gospels as one time. In Romans it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transfigured by the renewing of your mind. And then in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, it says, we are changed, transfigured from glory to glory. There the word uh, appears again. The transfiguration emphasises something magnificent. He was transfigured before them. <clears throat> now, why does it say that? Luke declares, as he prayed, he was transfigured. Perhaps angels have seen him transfigured. I don't know. Now it is before these three men, Peter, James and John. He's transfigured. And when you think of the majesty of that man, flashes of lightning. His face changed. The appearance of his face changed. His clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Think about that. They're standing with him and suddenly his clothes begin to flash with lightning flashes. And his face changed. What a moment. A transfiguration moment. Now, it is before them or for their sakes. You remember just a little moment ago, we'd read the scripture where it says, who do you think I am? What's your opinion of me? Who am I? <clears throat> Some said John the Baptist, the stern prophet. Others, Elijah, the prophet of fire. Others, Jeremiah, weeping for Jerusalem. But all man's opinions... But who is he really? Who is he? We've got to come to this moment to hear that. The revelation to Peter, thou art the Christ, the son of the living was good, but God, good. But God says, come to the mount and hear the father's thoughts. Now I'll talk about Moses and Elijah in a moment conversing with him. But in this moment comes God speaks, he says, this 
is my son. Listen to him. All these other voices are everywhere. Everywhere. Voices all around you saying this, that and the other. Destroying your faith. Instilling fear. But this is my beloved son, the father says. Listen to him. Get your ears away from all the, the glamour that's going on out there and all the noises that are taking place. Shift your eyes and focus them on the majesty of this man, Jesus Christ. He's the centre of it all. He's the centre of all history. All history points towards him and back towards him and coming again. He is. Blessed be his lovely name. Oh, but friends, what a moment this must have been for these men. God who spoke in times past, says the Hebrew epistle, now speaks to us in his son. The very message is the son himself. Let me just say God's afters are worth waiting for. My mums weren't, but God's are. However dark the now is, you will be taken to the Mount of Light. Now, it's e easy to have uh, wonderful Mountaintop experiences, they're lovely. And we all need them from time to time. But you've got to remember, if you're on the top of a mountain, you've got to come down at some stage. You've got to go through the valley to get to the next mountain. <clears throat> so what's happening in the, on the mountaintop is there's power, there's ministry of God in your heart as you stand there. But then suddenly, out of the blue... Moses and Elijah turn up. Now, I don't know whether they had a Google there to find out who they were. Because <clears throat> none of these men would have been alive when they were alive. But they, they knew who they were, Moses and Elijah. And they stood there with him. And listen, they were sharing his knowledge. His knowledge. Because it says they talked with him about what he was to accomplish in Jerusalem. Moses and Elijah understood the cross in and through what they saw the fulfilment of the plan of God taking place. Now remember, the men that were with him couldn't help him because they didn't understand what was going on. But these two men came and stood with him, understanding what he was about to go through and sharing with him. Now that to me is exciting. God's always got somebody around that will come and share with you. It mightn't be Moses and Elijah. But you see, Moses symbolised that in Jesus, the shadows of the cross are all fulfilled and withdrawn. And Elijah symbolises the era of the prophets, showing that in every prophecy, Jesus Christ is the centre of prophecy. So two men representing the law and the prophets are standing with Jesus and they're turning and they're basically saying, hey, it's over to you, Jesus. <clears throat> it's over to you, Jesus. You're the centre of it all. You're the centre of Scripture. You're the centre of truth. And they turn and they say, ah, over to you, Jesus. I just like that. <clears throat> Think, wow, to be able to turn it over. They spoke with him about what he was to accomplish, his death. His resurrection. And all of this is to be fulfilled in Jesus. I've got six minutes. Now just note in passing, this is for free. I'm handing this to you for free. Note in passing, they did not have wings, Moses and Elijah. They were stated as men. They were still what they had been in the essential fact of their being. Now please capture that, will you? The fact that they were known suggests that identity of personality is maintained in the world that lies beyond. You got that? Conscious existence with enlarged powers is also suggested because they were talking with Jesus about things they didn't know when they were on the earth. <clears throat> so now they have enlarged powers. Man, that excites me. So let's take it just a little further as we just come towards a conclusion, which is a long way to go, but there you go. <clears throat> While Jesus prayed, I just want to say, while he prayed, he was transfigured. And the measure of transfiguration 
is the measure of fellowship with Jesus. That's the measure of transfiguration. Measure the two together. Put them together and realise what God is, is doing. But what was happening is while this was going on, they slept. They were good sleepers because they slept not only here and in the Garden of Gethsemane. Good sleepers. But when they became fully awake, the Bible says, still dazzled and, and confused by the glory, with Moses and Elijah standing there, and they started to walk away. And we say, hey, just a minute, Jesus, don't let them go. <clears throat> this is a magnificent moment. Well, we're part of it. Yeah, we're in this. Keep them here. Let's build something for you, for them. <clears throat> Poor man. That impulsive statement of Peter's. Out of his great confession before, now Peter puts Jesus and the prophets on the same level. Hey, they're not on the same level. He is the supreme commander. <clears throat> he is the supreme ruler. He reigns above it all, as we've sung this morning. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He wanted to, you see what Peter wanted, he wanted to stay where he was. I love this experience. Keep me here. Now, I tell you what, there are a lot of Pentecostal, powerful Holy Ghost experiences that we want to keep. Take me back to that day when blah, blah, blah. Hey, go on to the next one. There are better ones ahead. There are better ones ahead. And listen, what Peter was doing, listen, Carefully, will you? The danger of mysticism is that it wants to hold things the way they are rather than moving on into God's next. You know, when you get as old as I am, you learn things are changing all the time. Nothing stays the same. You're moving on and moving on. And even spiritually, this is the truth. One man said to D.L. Moody, I'm always living on the mountaintop. And Moody said, how many souls have you won to Christ up there? Because that's the key. If I get a mountaintop experience, it's to take me back into the valley and meet the needs of the people there in the valley. That's what the mountaintop's all about. To put something into my spirit that will change. You know, it's not possible to stay, to stay where we are. We must either move ahead or go back. The only way to preserve the value of a spiritual experience is to go out and meet the needs of the crowds and see that being taken somewhere else. I just need to jump over a section here because time's run away from me. The cloud of glory came down upon these men and the Bible says they were afraid. Afraid. The cloud of God's glory. Do you know that fear is a sure sign that spirituality and zeal are at a low ebb? Fear can ruin what God wants to do. I'm not talking about the natural fears of life. They're, they're always there. I'm talking about those moments when the power of God came down. And the message Bible says they were deeply in awe of God, as this atmosphere of God's presence settled down upon them. And they saw no man save Jesus only. I love that special moment. Years ago in this church, an opera singer was saved. Her name was Suzanne Steele, brilliant opera singer. And she was gloriously saved. But she got cancer just in her 40s. And I went in to see her in the Peter McCullum Cancer Institute, stood by her bed, and from the moments of her coma, she was coming and going. And all of a sudden, she lit up and her eyes. She said, oh, pastor, I've seen Jesus. I've seen Jesus. <clears throat> and I stood there. She said it three times. I've seen Jesus. Oh, she said, it wasn't a physical form, it was just bright light, the glory of his presence. And she said, every time I wake up now, I think, am I still here? I don't want to be here anymore. And I never forgot, never walked out of that room, I thought, the majesty of that moment. Now, let me leave you, leave you one beautiful scripture. 
2 Corinthians 3.18. And I'm reading from the J.B. Phillips translation, which is a modern translation of the 1950s and 60s. But all of us who are Christians have no veils on our faces, but reflect like mirrors the glory of the Lord. We are transformed in ever-increasing splendour into his own image, and this is the work of the Lord, who is the Spirit. Isn't that majestic? You see what was moment, as he records the story in 2 Corinthians 3, the moment when Moses came down from the mount, and his face was a light, and they had to cover his face. Such was the glory. And here, the New Testament writer says, we reflect like mirrors the glory of the Lord. What happened on the mount? Jesus stood there and the blaze of the Father's glory came down upon him. And he stood there as a perfect mirror. He reflected back all that the Father was. Isn't that amazing? The reflection of the Father's glory there on the mountain. And he wants you, he wants me to be reflectors of the Father's glory. Show it in your face. Let people see the glory of God. Can I have one last story? Who's in charge here? Joe or Sam? One last story. There's a missionary from Australian churches, some of the God churches in, in China. And he, it was just an a English teacher on a university campus. And he walked around with a beautiful smile on his face. And I was down in Kun, um, Kunming, sharing there, and I had this interpreter, and she was brilliant, a brilliant interpreter, one of the best I'd had for many a day. And I said to her, where did you get saved? She said, well, on my university campus... There was this old white-haired man that used to go around the campus with a smile on his face. And I thought to myself, well, he's either cuckoo or he's, or he's got something that I want. And so she said, I sat him down one day. What is it about you, she said. He said, oh, am I allowed to tell you? And she said, yes. So he told her about Jesus. And he led her to Christ and out of that, 30 of her family came to Jesus as well. All because a man went round a university campus with a smile on his face that wasn't the ordinary smile of an individual. It was reflection. It was reflection of the glory of the living God. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we're so conscious of Jesus. We sung about him this morning, Lord, until our hearts were so filled and thrilled with you. We ask now, in Jesus' name, that your holy presence will instill into our hearts this same glory, the glory of Jesus. And if there are people here this morning, Lord, who do not know you as Lord and Saviour, oh, let that reflected glory touch their lives in this place today. Minister deep into their spirits and cause before they leave this place, they too will have been transfigured by the revelation of your presence. Listen, friends, once you've met with Jesus, you can never be the same again. Blessed be the name of